I think the greatest research on the power of visualization really started in sports. Uh, it was a guy named Charles Garfield who wrote the first book on peak performance in America. And he got the information about visualization in sports. He was at the Olympics in Italy, I forget which one that was, but way back when the Russians were winning all the medals. And he got one of the Russian weightlifting coaches drunk and he took him to a gym. And Charles, Charles is a weightlifter or was and he got him to show him why they were winning all the medals and what they were doing is they had perfected visualization most of us visualize we just go in and we kind of visualize this fuzzy picture of whatever we want the Russians were spending five to ten minutes doing color bars just to get the colors to come in clearly before they even began to visualize and then how they get the kinesthetics involved and get all their full energy in there and after uh, they Charlie got all this out of him. We started teaching visualization and athletics more. I mean, some people naturally did it. You know, they'd say, oh, I can see it so bad, I can taste it. You know, um, I remember reading about one of, the, I think it was Fran Tarkenton, a great quarterback in American football one time. He said, I would lie in bed at night before a game and I would imagine every possible scenario against any possible defense the other team could give. We're on the five yard line, they're in a nickel defense. We're at the 50 yard line, it's a three, two, one, whatever. And he said, I would imagine what play we were going to do and I would see it perfectly, everyone doing their thing. And so some people naturally just visualize it, but all of us can learn to do that. And every golfer who's learned to do it, every athlete of any kind that's learned to do it, has improved their performance. And we know the body can't tell the difference between a real event and an imagined event, which is why you can have a a stick on the ground it looks like a snake and you almost pee your pants because it, the imagination is so real your body can't tell the difference i take people in my seminars teach them this i'll take them i have them stand up close their eyes and i have them imagine they're standing on the top of the tallest building in the world which today is the burj khalifa in dubai which i've actually been to and uh, this tom cruise mission impossible the last movie was was filmed there and so you're like, I don't know, 125 stories up. And I have them imagine walking to the edge of a terrace that has no railing. And then they have to look down. And invariably everyone, you can see people shudder, they jerk, they, 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 you see them pulling back. Now, where were they really standing in a room? The worst they could have fallen was like three or four feet onto the floor. But they had sweaty palms, their, their heartbeat went up, etc. Why? Because the body could not tell the difference between a real event and an imagined event. So we can rehearse anything in visualization, actually get better at it. Jean Houston, who's a wonderful teacher, actually does, she'll, she'll take artists and she'll say, okay, draw me, you got five minutes to draw a leaf. No draw a leaf. She says, okay, now we're gonna close our eyes and we're gonna go inside and we're going to go to two years of art school in 10 minutes. And she has you imagine you're studying with a master and they're teaching you about shading and they're teaching you about the lighting and they're teaching you about, you know, lines and all this stuff. And then they come back, it's been 10 minutes. And then they draw another leaf. It's like looking at a third grader drawing a leaf and a master drawing a leaf like Rembrandt. The night and day difference is so amazing. And what all they did was they accessed the part of them that actually knows more, but it's not being accessed by the mind. Uh, and so visualization can increase our performance and I would say like 500%. I've actually participated in that with Gina and watched it happen. It's amazing. I've watched her do it with instruments, you know, people that play an instrument and then they do this two years and five minutes thing and they come back and oh my God, they're like, they play 10 times better. And then also we can use imagery to put in an image so that our subconscious will actually come up with a solution to a problem. Like when I wrote Chicken Soup for the Soul, I didn't have a title meditated, asked for a title, thought about it for weeks and went into meditation. On the third day, out comes a hand, it writes chicken soup. I say, what's chicken soup have to do with it? I said, you know, your grandmother gave you chicken soup when you were sick. I said, oh, it's not sick. It looks a lot about sick people. The voice said people's spirits are sick. Chicken soup for the sick spirit, chicken soup for the spirit, chicken soup for the soul, goosebumps. Title, it's now spawned a business that's worth a hundred million dollars. So. Cre the, you know, the, the imagination, we always say a picture is worth a thousand words or 10,000 words. Why is that? Because visual pictures are much more powerful. The subconscious thinks in pictures more powerfully than it thinks in words. And that's why, you know, we, uh, we will see just one photograph and the whole world of emotions go through us. Whereas I could say a name, I'd get some, but it wouldn't be the same thing. Well, you know, a lot of people tell me I can't visualize. You know, I close my eyes, I don't see anything. And and if anyone's watching this and that's you, you know, what I'll do in a seminar is I'll say, okay, close your eyes, you who don't see anything, right? I'll say, can you imagine your car at home? They go, oh yeah. 
Uh, can you imagine sitting behind a wheel? Yeah. Now in a moment, I'm going to ask you to open up the glove box. I want you to imagine there's something in there you would never expect to find in your glove box. So go ahead and open it up and tell me what it is. And I go, oh, it's a gun, or it's a doll, or it's an apple. And I'll say, can you see it? Mm, not really. How do you know? I, I just know it's a gun. That's visualization. And it's, there's some, about, I don't know, 30, 15 to 30 percent of people are what are called eidetic visualizers. They actually see it like a Metro Gold Mare Technicolor Super Scope Dolby Sound movie. Most people don't, and they think they're not visualizing. But just thinking the thought and kind of picturing it in your mind. Now, what you can do to develop your visual capacity, because you can do this, you can train yourself. Like right now, we're sitting here in my living room and I'm looking at a lamp. I can close my eyes and try to imagine the lamp. Then I open my eyes and go, oh, I missed all the little dots going down the side. So I close my eyes, I put the dots back in. Then I open my eyes, oh, I missed a little rim around the bottom of the shade, and I put that back in. Open my eyes, oh, there's light on the left-hand side there coming in from the window, I put that in. So you're beginning to build the visual muscle. And the more you do that, the more powerful your visualizations become. So I think it's a valuable thing to learn how to do. Um, some people, it comes natural, others of us have to train ourselves. You know, I teach a whole system that has 64 principles of success in it, but there's about 25 that I call the core basics. Like, you know, like you have like for, you want to play soccer, you got to be able to kick a ball, you have to be able to catch it with your head, and there's certain skills you have to develop. So these are them. Number one, take 100% responsibility for your life. If you're a blamer and complainer, you're in trouble. So give that up. Number two, get in touch with your life purpose because if you're setting goals that are in line with your purpose it's what Stephen Covey described as getting to the top of the ladder and finding out the ladder is leaning against the wrong wall you don't want to do that a lot of people go my god I'm successful I'm not happy well you got the house you got the car you got the, the fame and the fortune but you never developed yourself spiritually or you didn't discover that you needed to be of greater service or that you, the relationships were important in your life whatever so get really clear about your purpose so that your goals are the manifestation of that. Then create a vision. What would your ideal life look like if it was perfect in health, relationships, fun and recreation, travel, possessions, um, money, job, career, etc., and service. And then when you've got that clear vision, now set specific measurable goals. How much by when? See, to say I want to lose weight has no effect on the subconscious. But I will weigh 175 pounds by August 15th, 2014. That basically tells the subconscious, I want this result and I want it by that date. Now if I close my eyes and visualize what I would look like, and I visualize doing the activities like exercising, eating healthily, saying no to sugary desserts, etc., then my mind gets programmed to come up with that picture. We've all put GPS systems in our cars lately, or we have them on our iPhones and we use them in our cars. I can go into a, my car, I have a Lexus outside, and I type in an address in LA I've never been to before, and my car says, take an immediate right, go 100 yards, take a left, get on the freeway, stay here for 84 miles, we'll talk to you later. Then it says, coming up in one mile, you're gonna need to take a right-hand turn. It tells me exactly how to get there, but it doesn't work if I don't put in a destination. You have to have a destination. Your brain works the same way. Your brain is a GPS system, but it needs a destination. The destination is your goal, stated in words, and then visualized in pictures. And then the GPS system says, okay, now I know where we wanna go. We'll figure out how to go there. And that's when you'll start getting uh, what I call inspired act action thoughts. You'll be in the shower and you go, oh, I should call my cousin Morty. I don't know why I wanna call cousin Morty. Just call him because your intuition said to and you call him up and he says, hey, I just started this new multi-level marketing company. I think you should be involved in it. And all of a sudden, two years later, you got passive income of $100,000 a year, which you never would have happened if you hadn't called Morty that day. So you get, you start to get inspirations of things to do, things to say, people to meet, etc. And then you need to do them. In other words, action is required. The last six letters of the law of attraction are A-C-T-I-O-N. The word satisfaction in Latin comes from satis and facere, which means to make, like the manufacture, a factory. And the word faction, satisfaction means enough making, enough doing gives you joy, gives you satisfaction. So there is action required. But before we get there, you want to affirm and visualize your, your goals every day, visualizing for a few minutes in the morning, a few minutes at night. And then you have to believe it's possible for you to do it. So you've got to look at your belief systems. The biggest thing that trips people up with the law of attraction is their unconscious limiting beliefs. I want that car, but I can't afford it. I want that car, but people are going to resent me and my family if I have it. 
I want that car, but if I have it, my kid will probably wreck it. So all of a sudden it's like saying, hi, Domino's Pizza, I want to have a pepperoni pizza with peppers and onions and tomato. And, oh, but never mind, I can't afford it. <laughs> you know, you call up the pizza place five or six times, they're going to have your call number. They're going to go, don't answer that phone. <laughs> that guy's crazy, right? So we don't want to be uh, canceling the order every time we put it out with a negative thought. And yet, the, all the, a, lot of, a lot of those negative thoughts are unconscious. We're not even aware we have them. I'll give you a good example. I had a friend... Uh, took one of my seminars about five years ago. And he, I thought he was an amazing person, but he wasn't doing well financially. It didn't make any sense to me. I said, it's gotta be a limiting belief in there. So there's this process where I ask people to close their eyes, get in touch with something you want that you're not manifesting, and then feel the feeling in your body of not having that thing, the frustration, the resentment, the resignation, whatever it might be. Then I ask them to locate a part in their body where there's some kind of tension, pain, some feeling of something different. They scan the body. He got in touch with a band across his back, tension in his shoulders. Then I say, get in touch with that feeling and really feel it. And we, how wide is it? How big is it from side to side? How tall is it? Is it hollow? Is it, is it solid? Is it wet? Is it dry? So really focus on it for about a minute or two so you really feel it. Then go back in time to the earliest time you can remember feeling that exact feeling. And all of a sudden, he was with his father he was just out of high school, and he'd gotten a job at the same insurance company his father had. And his first commission check, he was so excited because it was really large, and he thought, oh, my dad's going to be proud of me. He takes his check, and he shows it to his dad, and his dad's face kind of looked like And he saw his dad become crestfallen. And he said, I realized at that point that my check that month was bigger than my dad, who had been working for that company for like 20-some years. And he said, I loved my father. It pained me to see him in pain like that. And I made a decision, I'll never do anything that would cause my father pain again. Now he made that when he was like 18 or 19. Here he was in his 40s, not making a lot of money and not realizing that he was still operating under that limiting decision he made. It was unconscious. Whenever he'd start to have more success, he would sabotage it. This part of him that didn't want to hurt his father. When he was able to bring that into his consciousness and realize he didn't need to do that anymore and that he could make as much money as he wanted, he left that seminar and in two days, two days, made one-fifth of his previous year's salary in two days and went on to like triple or quadruple his income for that year and now he's making a ton of money. So that's the kind of thing. We, we've got these limiting beliefs that we don't even know we have. So we have to release those through, there's many techniques, tapping, uh, Sedona Method, Byron Katie's work, etc. And then we have to have a plan. You need to make a plan for how you're going to achieve these goals. So it, the plan may not be exactly the way it happens, but without a plan, we won't take action because we don't know what we're supposed to do. If you don't know what plan to make, then go find someone who's already done what you want to do. How did you start the salon? How did you become a best-selling author? How did you get your own TV show? You know, whatever it is. I want to do what you do, but I don't know how you did it. If someone came to you and said, hey, how did you get your own TV show? Would you tell them? Yeah, you'd be glad to. Most people would. Most people are glad to tell you how they lost 50 pounds, how they became a millionaire, how they got their own column in the newspaper, whatever. So if you don't know what to do, go ask somebody. Now, what you're saying, and I think it's true, is that, it, but see, here's the deal. Think of this as an evolution in consciousness and an evolution in personal empowerment. You and I are primarily living right now where we surrender. We, we have a vision of something we want. We kind of surrender it, and then things show up, and we, we follow them. You know, I ended up having a, a lot of TV work for a while. I didn't plan to go do it, but someone said, hey, what would you think if Chicken Soup for the Soul became a TV show? I go, cool, let's do it. You know, and then out of that, someone said, what if we made a Chicken Soup for the Soul movie? What if we did a Chicken Soup for the Soul musical play? Now, I hadn't planned all of that. I remember once when I was a teenager, I wanted to be an actor. My cousin was an actor, so I said, I want to act in a movie someday. And I let it go. And then along comes a secret and I get to be in a movie. And then because I was in that movie, I got to be in a movie called, uh, Liv uh, the, um, the, oh, I forget what it's called, Living the Key, something like that. And I actually got an acting part. I actually got to pretend I was a, a, a motivational speaker. I got to talk at this person and tell him he was running away from himself. I got to really act. It was fun. Now, it took a lot of years for that to happen, but it did show up. But I think what's valuable about what you're bringing up is this. I, I, my friend, um, uh, uh, 
Michael Beckwith, who's the black guy in the movie The Secret. Uh, he's a minister, and a beautiful man, and he has these four stages of spiritual development. His first stage, you feel like you're a victim. And a lot of people say, you know, I'm a victim. The world does it to me. I, my husband was abusive. My parents were alcoholics. I got raped when I was 17. Someone just robbed my apartment. I always feel like someone's doing something to me. Why, God? I feel like God's out to get me. But at a certain point, if you're lucky or if you're conscious or if you choose to or if someone bumps into you hard enough, you realize I'm not a victim. I can take responsibility for my life. And then you realize that the universe can be manipulated through these laws, like the law of attraction, the law of reciprocity, the law of vibration. So that if I meditate, if I have a desire, if I do the certain steps and do visualization and so forth, these things actually produce results. That's where we were talking about people having a plan. But if you do that long enough, there's another evolution that occurs in spirituality where you begin to go, oh, if all these laws are so predictable and they work, there must be something bigger called the law maker. There's like, who created all these universal laws? Source energy, God, you know, whatever. And then you begin to go, well, maybe I should be getting out of my own little ego and asking God what I should be doing. So you become a channel for God's energy. You're doing, people say, I do, I'm doing God's work. My life is about service. And then if you do that long enough, you begin to go, maybe I'm not just a channel. Maybe this energy that's coming through me is also me. You know, what Michael Beckwith says at his church is something like, you know, God coming through me as me. And, and, and that's really where you eventually get. And then you get someone like an Eckhart Tolle or a Dalai Lama or a Ram Dass or some of these great spiritual teachers who literally live in that space of being God conscious all day long.